So my name is Jim Gates. Uh, I am a theoretical physicist, and uh, often people meet me and wonder, how does an African American like you get to do what you do at the age that you came uh, through? And the answer is actually on the screen. These are pictures of my parents. That's my dad, a picture taken in 1962, 27 years in the US Army. Uh, so I began my life as an Army brat. And that's not an insult. Those of us who have gone through that life happily own that term, brat. So I spent part of my childhood in Canada, uh, St. John's, Newfoundland. And that picture uh, on the other side of the screen is my mother. And my mother, this, but the curious thing about it is that picture was taken in 1942. And for the longest period of my life, I never even knew that picture existed until quite late, uh, a few years before my father died. And so my father uh, was kind of where I got my analytical side from. Uh, his grandfather could neither read nor write, but he could do arithmetic. Um, my mother, on the other hand, was sort of an artist. She crocheted, she fired clay figurines, uh, she did uh, knitting, and, you know, the sort of just artistic things. And so part of, it, part of uh, my luck is that these are my parents, and they had these two strange set of abilities that came to reside in me, and, that, and I've exploited these all, all of my life. Um, the other thing I think I'll do is, this is why I'm a scientist. This is a movie that came out in 1954. It's a science fiction story, but it's very strange. First of all, the production values are very poor compared to Star Wars and Star Trek. <laughs> And uh, all these things that you're used to these days, are very poor production values. But uh, at age four, I saw this movie in Canada. And it was the first time I heard the word science. And it may be the first movie I ever went to. And it, to me, science was, it was immediately clear to me that science was a doorway to adventure. And as a four-year-old kid, I wanted to have lots of adventures. And these, so it's all about inspiration. That's what Kate was giving, was inspiration. I have a friend who um, is named Paula Absol. I don't know how many of you recognize the name, but she's yeah, the executive Nova. director of NOVA. And I bet yeah. many of you have watched NOVA episodes. And a few weeks ago, I was reviewing something, and I found this interesting quote. She said, for the NOVA program, the goal was, A, we have to get the science right. So yes, we have to be factually correct. B, we have to be entertaining. And just as Kate just told you, you know, you've got to get, if you're going to be in a media like that, you've got to follow the rules about putting content out there. But she said, most important, we have to be inspirational. Mm -hmm. So you've got to combine those three stools in order to make it work. And that's what this meeting is about. That's what programs like NOVA is about. And all of us have our part to play. And so this was my inspiration, this crazy science fiction movie. Um, I wrote it down so I can watch it later. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> And uh, Marriott uh, uh, mentioned that uh, I often tell people I'm a simple country theoretical physicist. And that line is, a, is sort of a perversion of something that, uh, that the doctor used to say on Star Trek. If you remember, he was always a simple country doctor. So I'm a simple country theoretical physicist. I love what I do. And uh, I'm having this the time of my life. Um, so mentorship. Uh, let's go there for a while. Let's talk about mentorship. Yeah, yeah. OK. So as I said, uh, my father turns out to have been my first mentor, even when I didn't realize it. And for those of your parents, in case you're not aware, you're mentoring those young people in your household, even if you don't know that you're doing it. So you need to be uh -oh. intentional and conscious about that. Yeah. And so my father was a mentor. He uh, had an innate love of mathematics that I, not that he tried to make me do it, I watched him. And when I started school, I had trouble in, la in language arts, but arithmetic was trivial as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. So we were just the inverse of everything that most people experience as they go through the early childhood education. So I've had a, had a series of mentors that were just wonderful. That's one of my mentors sitting down in the middle of that picture. 1980, first time I met Stephen Hawking. I wow. knew Stephen from that year until the end of his life. Murray Gelman and John Schwartz, and they're very famous physicists at yes. Caltech. Uh, Murray Gelman is Nobel laureate. Uh, and from 1980 to 1982, I was a researcher in his group. The other lead professor in that group is maybe someone else you've heard of, a guy named Richard Feynman. Yeah. So I actually got a chance to be tutored wow. as a scientist and also as someone who speaks about science directly from one of the masters, Richard Feynman. That's and awesome. then finally, an, uh, well, we'll skip that one. I like that picture. That was okay, we'll picture. go back like to that. it. How old are you? Then? So this picture, this was actually my Caltech ID. I so love this, that picture. So 
I used to have the, what I call the perfect circle afro. Yes. And um, beautiful. that provoked a comment actually from Richard Feynman when I first met him. Uh, I was at a table feeling very nervous. A lot of you know, other very obviously very smart people there. And I figured, you know, if I say something, they'll figure out I'm an idiot. Aww. So the simplest plan is just keep quiet. That way they can't figure it out. And Feynman was sitting probably the distance I am from you. And he looked over around the table and he said, Mr. Gates. And I said, yes, Professor Feynman. He was one of my heroes, a lot of us in physics. And he said, you know, when I was your age, I wanted to wear my hair just like that. Um. And I had this vision of Feynman in an afro. <laughs> <laughs> so my fears of Feynman immediately disappeared. Oh. But that's the kind of mentoring that I got as a young person. Yeah. So it turns out the roles of mentor, mentors are just so incredibly important. And I, I was so fortunate in my life that when I heard, the first time I heard the term role model, I couldn't figure, figure out what it, was meant, what it meant until I then realized I had, I had had so many I hadn't noticed. <laughs> so we'll, we'll stop here and maybe get into the panel discussion. Yeah, that's, that's super important actually, the role modeling and the mentoring. Um, but you're right, you, when we first were chatting, we were starting to talk about STEM sort of writ large. And one of the things you mentioned to me was your first trip to China and uh, the yes. questions that left on you. Sure. So um, in 2009, no, I'm sorry, uh, two, yeah, 2009, I got a chance to take my family to um, Beijing. And for I tell all Americans, if you haven't been to China, you need to go. Because it is only by going to China that you will understand what the competition really looks like. You may have all these images in your head that uh, come from our media experiences. I, I remember when I was a kid, there's a film called... Uh, Dragon Seed. I don't know if anyone in this room actually knows it. Stars Catherine Hepburn as a as a Chinese peasant woman. Kind of, kind of an interesting image. But Dragon Seed, you can go find it for yourself. But the point is that uh, you know we have as Americans we have all these images that are media induced images of what China is. Until you go to China, uh, you have no idea what it is. And when you go and experience uh, large cities like Beijing, it becomes completely clear what China is. So I was walking around Beijing and uh, had this really weird sense of deja vu. But it was my first trip to China, so I knew that uh, it couldn't be a memory that was actually uh, occurring, that it had to be something else. And so the something else I eventually figured out was that I hadn't gotten a sense of a city like that walking around since the early 60s in the United States, and what I think I caught was a sense of a people confident in building their future. Because that's what America used to be like when I was a kid. You would walk our great cities, and it was clear that you watch the interactions of people that everyone thought the future would be brighter, would be better, could be made better. And that's the strange sense that I got in Beijing, walking around the streets. And so that's where they are as a society. So now we have to think about where we are. Um, I, um, in thinking about China, I like to make sure Americans understand that my perspective is not a xenophobic position. Americans have always thrived on competition. And so I think of China as our competitor, not our adversary. And we need to be approaching it as this is another competitor, as if you were, um, if you were a Longhorn down in A&T and uh, you had a competitor on the football field, that's not someone who's an enemy. It's a competitor. It's someone you're out to best on a field of competition. And that has got to be our mindset as a country mm. because uh, I, I tell people that uh, if you think of our species history, for most of the last 5,000 years, either China or India were the wealthiest nations on, on the planet. That only changed with Marco Polo. That's when the West had its rise. And I'm convinced that those Eastern cultures, China in particular, has a cultural memory of being the premier nation on this world's surface. Mm. And that's, what, that's the competition that we're going to be in. And whether we're going to succeed or not depends a whole lot about what happens around STEM education. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really vital point, and actually, um, when we were chatting, I sort of called to mind a couple of things. Um, I, w I was just in China last week. I was uh, we landed. I landed in Beijing, and I was in Shenzhen, which is a, 
a relatively small city of 13 million people. Right. Um, and we were there for the World Economic Forum's summer Davos meeting, which is focused on research. And of course, in China, uh, it is not uncommon to see investment in uh, STEM subjects, 20%, you know, research budgets year over year. Um, they've been doing that for quite a while now, and their volume of papers is, is coming up really quickly. And uh, my first time I was ever in China was about a half a dozen years ago, also for uh, one of these World Economic Forum uh, Summer Davos meetings. The real new meeting, if you ever want to look it up, the name of it is Annual Meeting of New Champions, but Summer Davos is the nickname. Um, and I remember going to this, um, walking through the conference center, there were all these uh, hostess ladies dressed in beautiful pink silk dresses that were directing you everywhere. And you could kind of eventually got to, you know, you, you felt they were there, but it was like it was like the almost the walls of the furniture. They were there, but you weren't really paying attention to them necessarily. And then one of them looked at me across the room, recognized me. She looked like she was seeing an old friend. Came over me with a big smile and said, "Scientific American, I read." what you do and then you know it was very clear to me then as you were saying people with a purpose people who feel like they're going to be successful the ambition was clear and I think that's something that is really important to us in thinking about how do we want to invest you also used in, in STEM and STEM education which is absolutely vital you also use the word competition and that uh, brings to mind another quick recollection that I'd like to share when I became a AAAS uh, fellow uh, a few years ago, Rush Holt was speaking, and Rush was a physicist congressman from New Jersey for many years. He's now heading the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And he was talking about competition in the form of Sputnik and the Sputnik era and what it kicked off for Americans at the time, the sense of purpose, the sense of we, we've got to get there. The, the flip side of the, con so there were many positive aspects of the competition. The flip side of it was he felt that in many ways some people felt left out. If they couldn't be part of STEM, how could they get there? Could, so could you, Jim, could you speak sure. a little bit to that? Sure. Okay. So one of the things I, uh, I often tell those uh, colleagues who were on our side of the line because, you know, we're all involved in STEM we think it uh, has something very important to contribute to the future of the country. We're enthusiastic about it. We bubble about it. Maybe not as much as Kate. But <laughs> she we, does bubble. But yeah. we do and bubble also. Many bubbles. Right? We bubble about it. We talk to family and friends and colleagues and students. And one of the things I often warn uh, those of us on our side of the fence is that as we do this, uh, a lot of people talk about uh, STEM. I mean, STEM. I'm sorry, STEAM instead of STEM. Insert the arts. And one of the curious things about that is that's right in my mind. Uh, I just came from a meeting at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, and the question, I was on a panel with Ellen Ochoa, one of our uh, country's uh, most experienced spacewalkers. She just retired mm -hmm. from NASA. Mm -hmm. um, and there were other, the president of RPI, a woman by the name of Shirley Jackson was I on the Shirley. panel. Yeah. Um, She's awesome. Yes, she is awesome. <laughs> a, re, a retired Rear Admiral, um, Oh my goodness, I'm, my age is showing. <laughs> uh, I'm no help, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, but the point was, the question was, are we going to Mars? Mm -hmm. And my response was, that's not the right question. That's like saying, are we going into the future? The answer is yes, we're gonna go to Mars. The question is how long it's gonna take to get there. Mm -hmm. And I'm rather more pessimistic than people like uh, Elon Musk, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. However, at the end of the day, we all agreed that whether, when we do this, it will, because, it will be because of American creativity and innovation. And early in the day, in talking to a group of people, we uh, came to the conclusion that that ability to create and be innovative rests on the ability to dream. And that's what the arts inspire. And so we're not disconnected from the arts. And that's something to keep in very powerfully in mind, that the creativity that we, that we want to bring to bear by the technical prowess of pursuing STEM disciplines will never be realized fully unless it is coupled to our ability to dream. And that is what the arts foster. Mm. I mean, and dreaming makes me think of how do we, how do we inspire others and include them. One of the things you haven't talked about yet is your service on the President's Council for Science and Technology and the, 
uh, during President Obama's administration and, and what happened there. Could you share that with us? Sure. So um, I was, um, in 2009, uh, my, li uh, my life sort of went through some kind of weird transformation. Within two weeks, I was invited to uh, serve on the Maryland State Board of Education mm -hmm. and also on the uh, U.S. President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. It's a group called PCAST. There were about 20 of us on the advisory panel. Uh, one name you might recognize is Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google was a member. Mm -hmm. Craig Mundy, who was the gentleman with number three at Microsoft at the time was on mm -hmm. there. Uh, our uh, uh, Harold Varmus, the mm -hmm. scientist who first figured out how cancer genes, how ordinary genes transform and mutate to become cancerous was on there, a Nobel laureate. Mm -hmm. And so there were 20 of us on the council that President Obama had assembled to advise him on issues of science and technology where they cross into the public policy domain. So we weren't there to play, to pretend that we were Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> However, the work that we did was rather fascinating and one of the projects I like to t tell people about, which you'll never hear about in the media that we performed, was uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, it was projected that we would have to, as a nation, curtail the use of things like this. Hmm. And the reason was because so many of us were buying these devices and were using the, and were using the electromagnetic spectrum because radio mm -hmm. waves are basically mm -hmm. electromagnetic waves. Right. But there were so many of us doing this that we were going to run out of spectrum because nature isn't making any more of that stuff. <laughs> so uh, President Obama actually tasked our re our, uh, the council with coming up with a solution. We did. Uh, we found that there was tech, uh, alternate technology that would solve the problem. It's called the internet. <laughs> because of the way the internet, the way you access internet is not the way you access radio. But if you just bring that technology over, and it's a proven technology, 20 years of success and growth and what have you. So it's not like you had to even test the technology out. All you have to do is import it into the use of radio signals. And so we wrote this report. Uh, and what we, in the report, uh, we uh, was led by a, a colleague of mine by the name of Mark Gornberg. It turns out Mark and I were freshmen together at MIT back 40 years ago, and I never wow. met him at the time. Huh. We lived, actually, we lived in the same dorm. Wow. Um, but the point was that the report showed a way in which to couple that Native American, what we used to call uh, Yankee ingenuity. It showed a modern version of that, how to get out of this problem of running out of spectrum. And when we first presented, presented reports, AT&T and the big telecom said, oh, that's just a bunch of ivory tower professors. They don't know what they're talking about. We're going to continue to do things the way we've been doing them. Within a year, they had changed their mind. Because when we did, wrote our report, we also carefully went through some calculations of how many more people could use, could buy these devices. And at the end of the day, they figured out that we were right and it would impact their bottom line. <laughs> and so that's what a science, science, scientific and technical council can do. We can look for out-of-the-box solutions to problems that no corporation is willing to do. And that's why having public support through the government of groups of scientists who are not tied to industries that are, in, that are incumbent stakeholders, mm -hmm. why it's so important to foster that. And I fear that that's not happening right now because there is no PCAS. This is the first time our country has not had a group of scientists directly advising the president uh, in over 20 years. So this is where we're losing out. And that's why I keep hearing China in the back of my mind, because mm. if you look at the Chinese government, it is full of scientists and engineers to a far higher extent than, than our, our government. You, you remind me of the first time I went to Moscow and somebody came up to me and said, uh, the U.S. has been very successful. You must have lots of scientists in your government. And I had a hard time explaining that, yeah. yeah. So, so let's talk about K through 12 yes, reports please. that sure. you also did because you know that's really the, right. the crux of it for us here. Yes, that's the, this crowd's meat and potatoes, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, the council wrote 40, uh, basically 40 reports in the eight years that it existed. And of those reports, um, four of them were directly uh, related to STEM education. And on those four reports, I was always one of the lead authors. That was one of my portfolios that I carried on the council was STEM education. Our first report was directed to K through 12. Uh, it was entitled uh, Pre Prepare and Inspire. And this report actually laid out the case for how we as a nation 
could invest in our K-12 STEM educators. Because in fact, uh, we haven't as a country done very good by them. So one of the things that came out of the, that report was a suggestion of 100K STEM teachers in 10 years. This has now been picked up by the Carnegie Foundation. I see at least one person shaking their heads. At least one person in the room knows about this effort. But again, this shows how government at its best interacts with philanthropic and corporate interests. So my previous example was how to help the telecoms. Here we're talking about how to help the school education system. The United States government invests only about 5% of the cost that it, that it takes to run our education system. Only 5%. Now I know people are astounded by it because they hear about Department of Education, this and that and the other, no child left behind. It's 5% of the money that supports our 14,000 school districts. 5%. Now they do have some rulemaking authority, but it's only 5% investment. And so one of the things that when you, uh, at the federal level, when you start talking about leveraging and setting models in place for education, you're aware of the very limited number of levers. And so what you want to do is actually build public-private partnerships mm -hmm. or public-public partnerships. So it's not that the federal government can make these things happen, because in fact it can't. And this, in fact, is one of the, um, one of the um, confusions that I, general American, generally American citizens have about our government. During World War II and coming out of the war, it is true that our government had enormous power to shape this society. That power no longer resides with the government. I can guarantee you that. It now resides with our large corporations. It's shared with our large corporations. And in some sense, you might say they, they have actually probably taken the predominant role. For example, in funding research, they are the leaders. It's mm -hmm. not the government anymore. Mm -hmm. So although you might hear things about our government, if you go and actually do a little research, because you're all STEM-based, evidence-based people, go do some research on these things. And you'll find out that these big messages that you hear do not correspond to the reality. So 10K and 12, but one of the things which I'm most proud of, because I had a direct role in this, um, I sp often speak to teachers and education groups like I'm here today, and I, this was true even while I was on the council. And um, one, on one occasion of speaking to teachers, there's a program called the Presidential, uh, Presidential Award for Excellence in Math and Science Teaching. Um, because if you take those letters together, I call those the Pampsters. <laughs> but I was speaking to the Pampsters. And after the meeting, after my presentation, a group of people, much like yourselves, all teachers, came up and said, you know, we love the fact that the federal government is willing to recognize our efforts. Because often for teachers, it feels like you're the only one. You're, it's like you're out in the wilderness, and there's no one else like you out there trying to save the country. And so to be drawn together in a cohesive group and recognized by the President of the United States, by the Secretary of Education, by members of Congress, that's a big deal for these teachers, and they really appreciated mm -hmm. that. But they also said, however, we want to do more for this country. It's nice for us to come here and spend a week in Washington, but we would like to go back and have an impact on our individual school systems. Mm -hmm. And so out of that conversation that I had with the teachers, when we finished our report, uh, entitled Prepare and Inspire, I specifically drove the issue of whether we could have what has evolved into the STEM Master Teacher Corps, where the government is making an uh, effort to make direct investment for teachers in K-12 through who teach uh, STEM, uh, STEM subjects. So uh, that's another example where you can see that you can make an investment, you can't make people do things. Jim, I wonder if you could talk about, if you're thinking about education, what's, you know, what, what's happened uh, since your reports and the impact they've had, and now looking ahead in our current situation, you know, what should we all be focusing on next, and what do you, sure. what do you see? Ahead? So let me start with the impacts power uh, portion mm -hmm. first. Uh, so as I mentioned, the K-12 report was only uh, the first in an arc of reports. The next report was called in, um, Engage to Excel, which is on the first two years of post-secondary education and what the government might do to foster uh, the spread of best practices there. T these two reports together have had an amazing impact on the country. In fact, when we wrote these reports, we were like very much aware of the political situation in the country where we have a Congress that was totally 
opposed to anything that came out of the administration. And so whatever we recommended, it could not be a call for additional appropriations from our Congress because it would be dead on arrival. Therefore, we concentrate our efforts on things that the administration, the Department of Education could do as with partnering with local educational authorities, LEAs as they're, as they're called. And um, so that was our mode of operation. And having, in the last, so the report came out in 2012, so in the last six years, I've had a chance to actually travel around the country and talk to people in different uh, education uh, districts and what have you. And it's been amazing to me that many of the things that we sort of put out as suggestions, people have taken up their own as their own causes and are making at the local level, say, calling for the kinds of coherent activities that were in our reports. And to me, that's sort of one of the best things about this country, that American citizens historically and traditionally have, been feel, have had the sense that we are empowered to make change and that it stems from the local level. And so although we didn't have the lever of Congress with additional money, putting the ideas out there, we have found people who are willing partners. And that has just been an amazing experience to travel across the country. One of the things uh, you mentioned going forward, it, all is not bleak. I mean, you often talk to people who contemplate the change in our administration and they, it's gloom and doom and you know, go home because the sky is falling. That's not quite true. Um, one of the things that to me was remarkable was that if you look at the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, which uh, if you're in K-12 education you'll some, you know something about, a large part of the language that you will find in the ESSA authorization around STEM education are things that come from our uh, Prepare and Inspire report. And so it shows that if you put out a message, even with people who are not disposed to being cooperative, if the message is actually grounded in reality, that eventually it had, that message can make its way through terrible political times. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>